Hello and welcome to Plat Chat Valorant and welcome to the First Strike Previews. This time we're going to be covering Fusion Fraggers and why you should care about this unsponsored team. Well, actually they are sponsored. They're sponsored by a Fusion Energy Drink, but yeah. they are not signed by an organization. And why you should care about this team moving forward into the Brazilian First Strike event. Starting with, in my notes I've got down here, intro. <laughs> Well, I love that you kind of take the same level of professional outlook to the large podcasts as you do for the, to these first strike <laughs> previews as well. I think that it's kind of a cool place to start, though, their lack of an organization. Because yeah. it, on Liquipedia, these guys are actually referred to as bottom fraggers because that's the name of their team. But everyone else calls yep. them fusion fraggers because they're sponsored by some fusion energy drink or something like that. That's literally what it's called, fusion energy drink. Oh, is that what it's called? Yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm not I'm not simping for the for the product itself, sure, so sure. I never went and took a look at what it was actually <laughs> called. It might not even be available in North America, man. It might only be a Brazilian only <laughs> drink. But yeah, that's it, it is interesting because I feel like not only is Brazil as a region overlooked by viewers in you know like the the wider world, yeah. Um, but but also by organizations at the moment. Like if you if you're a big org, if you're like um you know. In the past, it's been Immortals and Luminosity and these guys that have dug into the Brazilian scene. But if you're an organization and you want value for the long term, my God, does Brazil seem like value for money right now? Yes, absolutely. But I think the thing that pushes people away from signing these teams is because of COVID. There's not going to be any international tournaments anytime soon. It's sure. all kind of region-based. Uh, it's a Definitely. point I brought up on the Plat Chat episode today. If you didn't mismanage your time and not you know, forget about wow. the things going on in your life, True. you could have been there for that episode. True. But... Uh, it, it is it is really interesting to take a look at those regions like Europe, like Brazil, and see that these fantastic teams, fantastic players, you can pick up some players for probably half, if not a quarter of the price uh, of a North American team yeah. and still get insane value out of it. And one of those teams is Fusion Fraggers because this team, if you look at this, their history over the course of how long they've played in Brazil, they have got such a winning record from top to bottom and yet still not signed by an organization. And more recently, obviously, it's tapered off a little bit as the level of play in Brazil has kind of caught up to them in a, to a certain degree. But generally speaking, they were the ones at the top at the earliest in the scene. And since then, obviously, teams like Gamelanders have come into the into the mix as well as like uh, No War 2.0, which are very recently coming in. But generally speaking, Fusion Fraggers have been that number one team through and through. Yeah. And the interesting thing is as well, Josh, is that my personal opinion is they're probably only going to get better now moving into the first strike event, despite their recent slip. Yeah, I, I mean, there's... The, the Brazilian scene itself has a lot of competition at the top. And so Gamelanders were also dominating the beginning of the Brazilian scene and, and still winning tournaments. So I mean, there were so many tournaments, right? The, the, there were a lot, yeah. yeah. And, and both of the both of those teams took like a break in the middle. But definitely, I think you could say that Fusion Fraggers have been the number one team in Brazil for certain periods recently. And this the, the, the scene in general is just so exciting. I, I think that... If you're not watching Brazilian Valorant, you are really missing out. And I think oh, yeah. that everyone should be fans of this region. I think, Brent, it is impossible to not be a fan of Brazilian Valorant if you actually watch it. Sure. Yeah, it's it's because the style of play is so fast and loose and aggressive. If you like seeing teams like Sentinels play, if you like watching Tens play, you know, yeah. the, some of these individuals where they play at... One of the things that I admire most about players like Tens and like the way that these teams like Sentinels play is that they can play at a very high degree in tempo, but they also think very fast at the same time. Like yeah. They're not just inting into it with chaos. And at times we've said on Plat Chat Valorant when we've been discussing Brazil as a region that it we, we've made jokes about it being a bit scrappy, a bit messy, but it's getting to the point in Brazil now where these teams are finally distilling their own gameplay. And there's no better example of this than Fusion Fraggers as a team. Because I think that as time has gone on, the most recent tournament they played in, um, the name escapes me a bit, but they played No Walk 2.0, which is another team that's yeah. just blown up onto the scene. But the level of play, if you compare it now, compared to uh, about a month ago, if not two months ago, then you you'll see a drastic change in the way that the game is played. Uh, it seems so scrappy earlier on if you watch some of the earlier tournaments but this tournament here is so comparable to some of the top levels i think in a lot of regions like north america and europe and people don't even consider them on the same level 
Yeah. It, it's kind of ridiculous. It, it is. And I think one of the, I mean, the biggest reason is because there isn't really very much English casting for these events, I think. Yeah. So people don't really know about them. But we're here to spread the good word, ladies and gentlemen. We're <laughs> the spreading word. the good word of Brazilian Valorant. Because the, the, the place you have to start with, in my opinion, when you look at Brazil, is that they, their individual fragging is bonkers good it's yep. really good and that is kind of your foundation to build everything else out of if you don't have the player base to be able to find the guys that can hit the shots really well you don't have the foundation to be able to build great things out of so so when you know we recently did a video about vision strikers they're not working with a really deep pool of players over in korea uh it, cs hasn't been uh, you know, really taken off within the region. Um, yeah. There are some other smaller. Uh, there are some other games that are smaller in the West, like Crossfire sudden attack, and a Crossfire. Sudden attack. Yeah, but but not that hasn't really transferred over into Valorant. Whereas C CS in Brazil is enormous, and Rainbow Six in Brazil enormous, and so the player base that you have to draw on for Valorant is huge. Some yeah. of these guys play in uh, Overwatch Contenders in the past. Some of them are uh, Rainbow Six players, although that does. Seem to be a smaller number some of them are cs players that have just been hanging out in cs for so long you can tell by the way how many brazilian cs players there are that have been inspired by the former greats because of all the people that have zero at their end the yeah. end of their name from called zero <laughs> uh, i mean we'll talk about that more when we do the the game landers uh tournament but they've got uh mw zero on that team who's fantastic and it's just like the the there's Champ Zero who plays for another team as well. I can't exactly remember which team that is off the top of my head. But I, they, they've just inspired yeah. a whole range of new this the is, generation of Brazilian talent. And that is the coolest thing, I think, about Brazil as a region. And Fusion Fraggers as well is really, uh, I think, a great team to highlight this as well. But it's the idea that, like you've already mentioned, Josh, regions like Korea, where they just don't have this pool of young talent coming into the game. It's a lot of kind of like the old guard. Vision Strikers is made up of some very old players who come from CS 1.6 uh, and beyond that. Whereas Brazil, as a region, uh, and you especially see this in CS, but you it's very, very um, obvious in Valorant, but there are so many tournaments happening on a regular basis, and the teams, the top teams, are constantly trading blows with one another. There yeah. hasn't really settled. And the one common denominator between every single team that you will watch is the mechanical ability of almost everyone on each squad. Yep. It's not like you never really see a weak link in terms of mechanical ability. Everyone, and I mean everyone, can hold their own in a clutch scenario or a 1v1. They are always confident in their aim. And you said, Josh, earlier, it is the foundation of what the kind of Brazilian scene lies upon is that raw mechanical ability. Yeah. But it is literally what everything derives from in the way that they play the game. Because you'll find that... It is quite rare to find a Brazilian team that plays quite slow, quite uh, a patient style of play. There are teams in Brazil that do that, but generally speaking, everyone is so confident in their own mechanics to be able to win out gunfights, yeah. and they're so confident that their team can back them up with trades if they don't win the gunfight, that the pace of the game is just elevated as a result of it. Yeah. So you, you get this magical mix of Valorant that you don't really see in many other regions where yeah, they are no just playing region. balls to the walls and that we are finally, finally getting to the point now where you're seeing that aggression tempered and honed and you're starting to see some patient set executes included into it and you're getting this magical mix of where you you are literally witnessing right now a region potentially becoming the dominant region. Because I don't think yeah, it's a stretch. I don't think it's a stretch to say in a year or two's time, Brazil would be the top region in this game. It's kind of crazy to say it now, but I absolutely understand where you're coming from because that we've already seen that happen in CS as well. Like, okay, maybe not that Brazil would be the dominant region, but we had a sure. very dominant team from that region and multiple, like, uh, tier two, not tier two, but, like, tier... Uh, the tier just beneath the absolute elite. They were still able to compete at the at the world stage. They just weren't quite on the same dominant level as as that uh, uh, that that squad with yeah. like Fall and Cold Zero, Taco, those kind of guys that were uh, throughout a range of different organizations. But I I think that's a very good point. Brazil has so much um, room to improve. And the potential there is enormous because there are so many guys that can just hit ridiculous shots and have 
no fear. They are playing an yeah. absolutely fearless style. And Fusion Fragus is a great example of that style as well. But like you said, Bren, they have tempered it in, in recent times. Look, to dig into some of their players a little bit more, I think we want to start with some of the players that demonstrate the kind of raw aggression the best. And so yeah. I think you have to start with Fuzk. I don't know how you're oh, supposed to okay. pronounce this guy pronounce this guy's name at all. Fazik. Uh, Fazik. Fuzik. Yeah. Uh, it could also be some like Portuguese pronunciation of those particular characters that we would have no fucking clue. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. I think from listening to the Brazilian casters uh commentate their play, I think they say Fuzik. But also, I don't know what words they're saying most of the time, so that could be completely wrong. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought him up, though. I think he is the obvious choice. And if you were to only watch the most recent game that they played in the Grand Finals, he didn't have a great performance in that one in that one sure. series in the Grand Finals against No Org. But I think that was a one-off, because statistically speaking, this guy is head and shoulders above a lot of other players when it comes to uh, Rays as, as an agent. Um, he, he plays... I think the most raise out of anyone else in Brazil. And it doesn't necessarily shine in his um, sort of like the, the, his quirks. There's certain raise players in Brazil, like Leox, who are amazing w at using their satchel jumps for high mobility and high plays. But Fuzzik is definitely one of the best riflers when it comes to the game. And he also uses Raze's kit in a very intelligent manner. He is uh, honestly a joy to watch when he's just playing uh, in any other scenario, because you can often find him just at the top of the scoreboard in whatever match he's playing in. Yeah. I mean, his stats are really good as well. I mean, a 0 0.84 kill per round with a 1.24 KD is really good. And it's not like he's just beating up on bad teams all the time. He's actually playing against, you know, a, uh, the depth of talent in Brazil is pretty decent yeah. when it comes to the top level. Like the top five to seven teams are very competitive with each other and can can genuinely win tournaments uh, when you put them in uh, in together. Now, I would say that Fusion Fraggers are like the third best team at the moment. But again, Fusion Fraggers, you put them in a Brazilian tournament, they have a very good chance of winning it. It is hyper competitive. It's not like Europe or North America where, okay, in North America, Sentinels or TSM are going to win your tournament. Probably. It's very unlikely that one of those teams is not going to win if they're in the tournament. And over in Europe, G2 has been winning everything. But when it comes to Brazil, uh, you know, Vision Strikers in Korea, they are absolutely winning everything. When it comes to Brazil, any of these top three teams certainly can win. And any of, honestly, stretch out to the top five, any of those could win on their sure. game day. Um, so these stats are very impressive considering that kind of depth of talent within the scene. But I would say, Bren, that Fizik is probably not their best player. In my opinion, Crane is their best player, who's their Sover and Breach uh, guy. Because his fragging is really good, but he's also doing it from that like secondary position. And it's not just because he's able to come in and get the trade kills. He's just yeah. got that intelligence with his usage of utility on the Sover and on the Breach. And he's also just got ridiculously good fragging when it comes down to him so, having to take the 1v1s. Crane, statistically speaking, has just a statistical anomaly when it comes to his KD out of all the top sure. players in Brazil. He is, if you look at basically the average in terms of KD for a lot of these top players, you'll find that a very respectable score for KD is about 1.2 for your sure. KD uh, across the board. Cranes is 1.53. <laughs> he, yeah. he is, he is by a significant degree, much better than a lot of, uh, a lot of other player, uh, a lot of other players. And it, it's, you find that those numbers, you, you can often uh, attribute them to a lot of other players, but it's often also the best players on the other top teams, like Zan, for example, on B4. Zan or is crazy M good. Yeah. MWB Zero yeah. uh, for Game Landers. Like, these are players with comparable numbers, but even then, it's still 1.4. It's not 1.53, which is what Crane is working with on Sova. Like, it, it is yeah. absurd. Yeah, he's a fantastically gifted player. And also, I think to point out, the other people you're comparing him to there, Zand and M Zero. Now, we haven't done a preview video for those teams yet. Zand plays for B4 and MW Zero plays for uh, Gamelanders. But needless to say, they are the star players on those teams. Like, they, yep. they are the best players on those teams. Whereas... With uh, and crucially, they play the kind of fragging role, right? It's the jet or it's the race. Role, it's yeah. the duelist role. Whereas Crane is doing this from the more, 
I mean, it sounds ridiculous to call any Brazilian player passive, but and it's not passive role. It's a but it's position. it's the supportive position for sure. Yeah. And and Crane doesn't make it look like a supportive position because again, everyone on the Fusion Fraggers is pretty fearless with how they play. But it's only really Dragonite that I would say has a supportive role within the team. But he it's Physic and Delavine who are the duelists on this team. And so for Crane yeah. to be putting up this kind of performance alongside them means you have a trio of absolutely ridiculous fraggers to go Same. up against. It's so so ironic uh -huh. that this team is called bottom fraggers because their biggest strength <laughs> is their ridiculous individual play. And they've managed to hone so many other things outside of just that individual play as well. Yeah, just to put a, a, a nice end point on Crane as well as an individual, I would say if you are only following like North American Valorant, the most comparable player in terms of the way that Crane plays in my mind is Sinatra in terms of the intelligence of how he plays Sova. Both of these players are very intelligent in the way that they use their alts. Like Sinatra, sure. you'll find, I remember there was a defining moment in one of the, uh, one of the tournaments uh, that Sinatra was like, he essentially used the ping structure to line up the common angle when he was yeah, in yeah. mid haven at one point it's a super common clip of him doing it and he ended up clutching it out a lot ace, of fights actually it was yeah it, it was, was his ace right ace. and crane is like that but on crack it sometimes he's <laughs> using it to deny other ultimates he's using it to uh push out positioning now not every ultimate hits but it is a significant contributing factor to his high kd is the fact that yeah. he is always going to get value out of his ult i love the comparison to sinatra as well brand because something you can see when you watch sinatra is that his brain just works faster than other people he is making yep. he's in the server he is taking more actions per second than other people you know he's spamming a, a wall bang angle and then he's moving over to another angle and changing up his positioning and shooting various different locations. Mm -hmm. And then he's swapping a gun on the floor in order to shoot some more. And he's always being active. He's very rarely just going to sit there and hold a position. He will sometimes, but he's normally going to be trying, uh, trying to be as active as possible. And that is not just Crane, but Brazil in a nutshell, is just yeah. trying to do more actions per second in order to maximize your efficiency over, over the course of the entire round. And that doesn't mean you're always pushing, but you're always trying to be doing something, whether that's using utility, checking an angle, clearing an area, taking a gunfight, whatever it is, to try and be as active as possible. That's something that Sinatra and Tens, those are the two players that come to mind for me in North America very quickly in my head. Um, yep. And that, I think, is just like, if you enjoy watching those players play, you are really going to enjoy watching <laughs> Brazil and Fusion Fraggers. Yeah, well, who's next? What, what the, the next player? player would be Delavine, I think. I think okay. he's the next natural uh, person to move on to here because, again, part of the big fragging front line of Fusion Fraggers. Uh, he's yeah. their jet player. He's normally their AWPA, although having said that, Physic and Crane have both opted in, in the past. And also something to mention here is that we haven't seen them play on the op nerf patch. They've kind of gone silent as of the announcement so of First Strike. I'm glad you've brought this up because this is where this is the point where I wanted to bring this up here. But Delavine is a player who, statistically speaking, if you're going off of like the VLRGG metrics, is not um, out of like the top teams. Probably, uh, statistically speaking, has kind of the worst stats out of the top five. Right, you've got players like Zand and yeah. MW Zero out of the Jet players. Um, but the strengths of Delavine is not in the kind of raw, hard fragging ability. Even though Delavine is incredibly talented and can fulfill that role, but they play Jet intelligently, and there is nothing more scary than an intelligent Jet player. I can tell you right now from firsthand experience because there's a lot of all aim, no brain Jet players. But when you find one that knows exactly how to use their dash to supplement their team, to break ankles, to allow them them to, to create more space, to allow them to get the perfect angle, to, to avoid shots, to get in there and get kills when you don't have a, you don't have enough money to buy an op, you don't have enough money to buy a rifle. Delavine is doing all of these things. Sometimes you see them on half buy rounds and the magic he does with just that one signature ability, that's the dash, is insane. It, it gets a lot of value out of it, a lot of value. And I think the play style of Fusion Fraggers is like, yeah, they use the ops, but it's not the central game plan. Like you see with a lot of other teams, sure, they're, they're, yeah. they're quite similar to, um, I'm trying to find more comparisons, but I think Sentinels would be another apt comparison. Like they're a team that are not going to shy away from an op, but at the same time, they don't rely entirely around it, which is a big reason why you see Delavine's statistics not being as high as some of the other jet players, because they are really going to be relying on the ops. And this is before the nerf, before the 1.09 nerf that we're going to be seeing in yeah. action for first strike. 
And it's another reason why I think that Fusion Fraggers, out of probably, I would say, most of the Brazilian teams, I can't say with complete confidence, but they are probably going to be looking, honestly, better off the back of this yeah, Opnerf. This Opnerf is going to be affecting a lot of teams negatively, and they're a team that haven't built their entire game plan around it, so they're not going to be caught off guard, essentially, now when they're playing the game, trying to relearn it. Yeah, definitely. I, I would agree with that. I think that... You know, the, the best way to play Jet, in my opinion, it always has been to get value out of rifling and dashing in order to, uh, when you're playing attack, that is. But with sure. this op nerf, it is now 100% the best way to play the, the agent, um, rather than just trying to create magic when you're, uh, when you're attacking. You, you mm -hmm. actually want to be utilizing your abilities to be a team player and, and break open those choke points. I think that's something that Mixwell does pretty well. I mean, the, the Liquid guys love to, uh, cast aspersions on G2 and say that they're just an op one trick kind of team. But I think that they're very good on attack as well. As a team that like plays pretty much exclusively with a jet, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. literally exclusively with a, with a jet, they're, they're very good at still being able to use that jet intelligently on attack. Um, Tens also did that pretty well as well. Uh, yeah. Although it did sometimes op on attack. Uh, I, I, Th then you've got Vixen and you've got uh, Dragonite. The Vixen is the smoker for the team. Dragonite is the cipher. These are more of the supportive players, although you wouldn't really think that if you watched the finals because Dr uh, Vixen put up like, I think he went like 22 and 7 or something on, yeah, uh, was, on Bind to open out the I series. I think it was 27 and 7. Oh, God. I mean, it, yeah. yeah, it was just ridiculous. Like, yeah. in terms of Vixen's raw numbers. But yeah, th this is the... I think that's a great example, though, that highlights the fragging potential from top to bottom. Sure. It's not yeah. just three players who are going to be putting up the top numbers every every game players like dragonite and vixen whereas i think a lot of players will probably be getting into valorant a lot of uh i'm, I'm not going to name any names but there's a lot of tier two players from other scenes who see valorant as a golden opportunity for them to maybe just you know earn a quick buck join a team while the competition's low while the barrier to entry is low while they have the connections and they often get defaulted on to cypher or omen the kind of smoker sure. roles or the lurker roles because it's something that you can you can do your job and you're, you're not expected to top frag every single game yeah. yet these guys are more than capable of doing that and that is the beautiful thing about brazilian valorant is that at any moment any one player on the team can be that player that steps up and clutches yeah yeah for sure i i think that to say that Dragonite is the lowest fragging player on fusion fraggers he's still a very good guy like he's he's yep. not gonna be a consistent bottom fragger he's not gonna let you down in the clutches he's still um he's still very competent in terms of his own individual skill it's just that brazil as a region is stacked with so much fragging power that uh that he looks like that but yeah if you put him up against some of the cypher players over in north america in particular where i feel like that has been a trope of the lower fragging players just getting thrown onto that role in order to have some value still across the rounds. Uh, I think he would dominate them, <laughs> a lot of them, yes, when yeah. it comes to the individuals. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the way that the team is is built out. And they've been putting up good performances over the course of a bunch of different tournaments over in Brazil. Um, a map that I love watching them on, though, is Split. And I want to pull up Brand their stats on Split because they are one of the teams that has kind of defined how Split is played in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And it's very different to the everywhere else in the world. Because if you look at their Split statistics, they have an 81% win rate on Split. It's clearly their best map, I think, both when you watch them and when you, uh, when you look at the stats. But weirdly, their defensive round win percentage is only 40%. So it's like, all right, how, well, how are they getting these wins? The reason they're getting the wins is that their attack round win percentage is ridiculously high. Now, here it is, it is only at 49%, but that is partly because they occasionally have games where they will go genuinely 12 and 0 on attack rounds on split. And then sometimes they'll go to back to the normal where you're expected to get, I don't know, what, four to five rounds on split attack. Like, yes. they'll, they'll oscillate between the normal um, decent performance of four, four or five attacking rounds, all the way up to 12. And I know that 12 sounds like an exaggeration, but there have been multiple times where this team against another top team has put up 12 attacking rounds on split. And the reason for that is they are literally fearless. They will pressure all sides of the map at once and try and take fights. And split is the kind of map where the defenders get the advantage by kind of 
holding map control. It is it is difficult for oh. people to just walk up mid or walk up A. It but honestly if, feels like the antithesis of the way that Brazil likes to play as well. Yeah. How you're supposed to optimally play split. It's a, it's a map that's you're going to get punished if you try and go for those heroic plays. But they just turn it into an attack-sided map. It yeah. is it is truly ridiculous um, what they're able to do. Uh, and the, I think it showcases their absolute fearlessness in playing these maps as well. Because while other teams will slowly move their way up the map, trying to clear every angle, when you watch Fusion Fraggers play Split, they'll push a couple of people together, you know, two, three people will just run down mid. And if the first guy dies, the second guy will trade it. And so they are sacrificing their ability to set up the best aim duels possible for map control. They are going to take the map from you. And the best thing that you can do is trade. Because they're not you're not going to be able to just spray them down as they come through an angle. Because their second guy is spaced pretty perfectly to be able to get the, the trade kill yeah. onto you. And so they're like, all right, we know that split is a defensive map. But instead of slowing the pace of the game down, we're going to increase the pace to the point where we are just ripping control of the map away from you and sacrificing bodies to get that that uh, that map control. And it's mm -hmm. so cool to watch. I think it's an intelligent take as well on how to play split. And out of all the teams that... that would play like this it doesn't surprise me that it's fusion fraggers are the ones that you're bringing up because they they just seem like they have they are a team that have put a lot of thought into the way that they play in terms of the discipline like yeah they've got the the unbridled aggression that they like to chuck at people and they've got the mechanical ability to back it up but they are I, I mean as i've said this entire time that we've been recording this they have just been honing that aggression and getting some discipline in and those set plays and part of that discipline is making sure you trade effectively yeah um, which you see fusion fraggers do so so often yeah absolutely i mean they're the the thing to note here as well is because they play at such a high tempo they put a lot of pressure on the defensive team uh, if you're yeah. a defender and you just see them barreling towards you they're not just gun out barreling towards you. They're throwing utility as they push, and it's all planned utility. They just do it at a higher tempo than most other teams would. And so if you're the guy that's supposed to stand there and hold this angle, and you know there's like three people coming for you, and you're getting flashed, and there's a Sova recon dart on you as well, you're under so much pressure to defend that location. And even if you do your job and get the first kill, the second guy is perfectly spaced to be able to get that that. That, uh, that trade onto you um yeah. and it's it's this high tempo incredible pressure that makes them overwhelming to deal with and i think if there was a global event able to happen right now the brazilians would surprise almost everybody with this level of play because the only way to break it yeah the only way to break it is to be like out frag them or think faster than them and they're already yeah. so fast that good luck with that I'm really looking forward to the First Strike Brazil event, I think, as well. It's kind of um, an aspect we didn't really talk about, but the reason you see so many of these top Brazilian teams playing in so many tournaments is just the, the, the prize pool generally, like the limit at which teams decide to enter a tournament in North America. Like you never see the tier one teams really entering in any 10K tournaments anymore um, because they, they don't want to reveal strategies or they don't want to, you know, give away certain things. Um, but in Brazil, generally speaking, like every team will be playing in every tournament because I mean, per per dollar that you're earning through prize money, it's worth a lot more in Brazil just sure. by the nature of where they're living as well. And I'm excited for the first strike events because I think this is going to be, they haven't announced the prize pool yet, but I, if I was to guess, I would assume that the prize pool would kind of match uh, if not come quite close to all the other regions which kind of inherently raises the stakes of brazil as a region for this first strike tournament for sure. almost everyone involved if you think about just the money now the money isn't going to be the primary motivator for these teams it is literally going to be to claim the best in the world to get sponsored to, to turn it into an actual career because so many of these teams are unsponsored but it's going to be a nice little, I think, storyline to keep in mind at the back of people's minds. If you are watching the First Strike Brazil event, just thinking about how literally every single match matters to almost every player involved in this tournament. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, this is also an opportunity. Th this is the first big event that everyone is really going to be going for as well. Yeah, Brazil has had a lot of smaller tournaments and a lot of them have had like BO1 uh 
starts to them or BO1 beginnings to the bracket and this kind of stuff. And it's been so back and forth between all of the top teams. At the moment, you would probably say, you know, maybe Gamelanders is the top team, but no org 2.0 is, uh, you know, coming out of literally nowhere and they're winning a lot of stuff as well. Fusion mm -hmm. Fraggers are right behind them. But at the end of the day, whoever wins First Strike is going to have a great uh, basis for which to say that they are the top team in Brazil. And I think that the closer we get to big LAN tournaments, the more these guys are going to be getting scouted by organizations. Yeah. And I think for anyone who's a fan of European and North American Valorant, the biggest thing when you watch First Strike is that you could be looking at the future world's best team. You genuinely could. At any point through this Brazilian First Strike tournament, whether it be the team that finishes first or genuinely whether it be the team that only gets to the semis or something like that, you give it yeah. a year and you you really could be looking at the best team in the world. It is, it is hard to say where the ceiling for Brazil is. And I don't think there's any reason to believe that the ceiling is lower than it is for Europe or North America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a completely fair fair comparison to, to make as well. And if you're wondering as well when the dates are for the First Strike Brazilian event, it was actually the second um, sort of event to be announced after Korea. Yeah. So the, we already know the dates pretty pretty soon, and we've talked about it on previous podcasts. But just as a reminder, the first Open Qualifier is taking place October 17th. That is only in a couple of days, assuming yeah. you're watching this as it just comes out. That is only in a couple of days. And the qualifiers come thick and fast after that as well, I think, every single week following. Um and it is a bit brutal. It is grueling. I mean, it's, it's best of ones. <laughs> I love the word brutal. <laughs> grueling, brutal, brutal. Yeah. Uh, it, because it is best of one matches until the best of three qualifying rounds, which is the round of 16. And it's 100, uh, 512 team brackets for each yeah, qualifier. That's crazy. Is absurd. But I think that also just is another metric you can use to just describe the amount of depth that Brazil has as a region. There is so much upcoming talent at all times in this region. You never know if you're going to be watching the next best player in the world. A absolutely. I mean, you can see the VOD right now as well. We were talking about them having an aggressive style, but in this round, they're literally just playing contact as well. They are just walking forwards until they see somebody and then killing them. But again, mm -hmm. because they're just confident in their ability to be able to trade for each other, play the fundamentals, uh, and overwhelm their opponents with with their fragging. It's such yeah. a cool scene to watch because it's actively... They, they've started from such a high level of individual skill that every tournament, they get better and better at the actual like team play aspect and the strategical aspect. You can actively see the development from being a, a teams that just kind of play loose all around the map to now being structured with their defaults and uh, making hard reads of their opponents and utilizing the, uh, the utility in supremely excellent ways. Uh, there are so many people on Reddit that love to catch the next hot thing, right? They, they, yep. they pride themselves on watching the you know the stuff before it was cool. They were watching Upcoming stuff before it was cool. Or, yeah. Yeah. There is no better region to watch to find the next cool thing than Brazil. <laughs> if you Brazil. want the clout. Yeah, farm you the want clout. That, that Reddit clout. There farm you go. the Reddit clout by watching Brazil, guys, because it's coming. The The time of Brazilian, yep. uh, maybe not dominance, but the Brazilian com competing at the top level, it's coming. As soon as these first events come out, Brazil is 100% going to be up there with the other regions. They, they just frag too well to not be. They, they frag yep. too well. They have good executes. They they trade for each other effectively. All of the fundamentals are there. They couldn't be bad. It is impossible for them to be bad. <laughs> I think that's a great place to, to end it, unless you wanted to add anything else as well. I but think I think so. that, that summarizes it perfectly. You know, if, if you're looking for a team to root for, Fusion Fraggers, a great option, not sponsored by an organization, just some young gunners just going straight for the top spot. Uh, and they're in a perfect place to do it as well. I think this team is perfectly set up. They're getting better and better and better as time goes on. So there you go. If you're looking for a team to root for during the Brazilian First Strike event, we've just given you one. So if you like the video, make sure you like and subscribe as well because we'll be putting out even more first strike previews coming up shortly should be one every single day assuming we can kick matt's ass into gear and <laughs> uh, and yeah we'll see you guys soon